Thank you and good afternoon and welcome everyone. First of all, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal of the Iraq nation, the traditional custodians of this land and pay my respect to the elders both past and present. Happy International Day 2021 to everyone. I'm Shiva, most of all know you know me already, National Chair of the Australia India Business Council, Women in Business. I would like to begin by thanking our host, Council General of India, Sydney. Uh, it is just amazing the way you embrace anything to do with the business, bilateral business space, and especially when it comes to women. I have had a long relationship, and there's another one who's also sitting right next to you, uh, who's been so passionate about this and so supportive. Thank you for hosting us today and for uh, organizing this event along with us. I'd like to especially acknowledge the presence virtually and in person of our esteemed guest, His Excellency, uh, we've got Gitesh Sarma, High Commissioner of India with us today. Of course, Manish Gupta, whom I've already introduced, Council General of India, Sydney. I've got Rowan Ellsworth, Council General of Australia, Kolkata. Barry was supposed to have joined us, but unfortunately he was called away in another event at the same time. Thank you, Rowan, for joining us from Kolkata. And it's very early in the morning, and we really appreciate it. <laughs> Jody McKay, Honorable MP, Leader of the Opposition, New South Wales. I don't know how else can I. There's a long list, and I'm going to perhaps introduce you a little bit later. But Jody, I cannot even say how delighted we are, because having known you over the years, it has been just amazing, your support. Anything to do with the business uh, sphere, bilateral business, and women. So, thank you for being here today. Um, I have Dan Tipping, Chair of Export Council of Australia. Thank you, Dan, for being here. And there's no question that uh, exports, imports, and trade are going to be the way forward, not just COVID, but post COVID, in view of the way the dynamics has changed across the world now. And especially with India, there's a huge opportunity. Thank you for being here today. Rose, um, Rose Lynn, uh, um, and uh, she's the group executive membership, Australian Super. Thank you for being here, Rose. Um, Sanishka Siomango, National Vice Chair of AIDC. Um, thank you for being here today. And she's also representing Jin, who's a national chair, who's in Queensland. Janabi, Janabi Pukan. She's the national president of Picky Flow. Thank you, Janvi. And we know that it's a very early morning for you, uh, but uh, it's a great day for both of us, with as well as Picky Flow. For the MOU, we are going to be signing, which will unlock huge amount of potential today. Uh, we have Sonia Gandhi, uh, who's my colleague, and she's the AIBC New South Wales Web Chair, sitting right next to CG. Mm. We have Julia Nippin. NSW Director of PFAD. Julia, how are you? Thank you for coming in and joining us. Uh, we have Helen Hamilton-Jones. I think Helen is going to be virtual. Helen, are you there? Oh, she was going to be coming in for another event, but she'll be definitely when she's there. Oh, there you are, Helen. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Helen is from Deloitte, and she's a managing partner at Deloitte, um, Western Sydney. Harriet Diana Richards, ANZ Head of Corporate Affairs. Mm. Yes. Uh, was meant to join us. I think she will be here very shortly. Um, Kavita Singh, Chief Executive of Bank of Baroda, whom we are very proud of as a oh, very executive heading a Indian bank. Uh, then, of course, we've got Nimisha, educator and linguist, right next to me. And, um, uh, you know, in fact, uh, Nick will be surprised that she actually uh, was my VIP guest when we launched it in 20. Uh, with the multicultural audiences, and she has absolutely smashed them with the kind of stuff she came up with. So very inspiring. Thank you for being here today. Um, we've got uh, Deborah Singh. Deborah, thank you for being here, and I'm really looking forward to your sharing all these experiences that I know you have. Uh, Deborah is a board member, but also former leader MD of Woolworths India, and she's lived several years in India, and she'll have some amazing insights to share. Thank you for being here today. Professor Veena, Veena, we have to have you on here. Okay. Um, we managed to get a seat. Uh, yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. So we've got Professor Veena Sajwala. And thank you, Veena, for uh, what you've been doing in this 
science and technology space. And I have to say, um, if people hadn't seen Veena, please rewind and see ABC TV and you'll see her story. And I love the fact what it did for Veena. She's actually created a whole new apartment with renewable, uh, with the waste products. And they just launched it today, it's amazing. Um, Mala Mehta of IAB Hindu School, well known to everyone. Mala, thank you for being here. And Mala always pushes me saying, don't ever forget Hindi when it comes to business too. Uh, you know, she tells me, business is not only done in Mumbai, in Calcutta, uh, in Bangalore and Chennai. Business is done in v -talk, c talks where you have to know the local language. Thank you for being here, Mala. And um, then we have, of course, uh, uh, Professor Neela Mitter of QAAFI Center for Horticultural uh, Science. Thank you, Neena. Thank you, Professor Mitter, for joining us. It's amazing. She's been doing some great work in the agri space with India, and she'll share some of her insights. Dr. Meena Sindhya Chavan of Macquarie University. Thank you, Meena, uh, for joining us, too. I know that her video is giving her problems, but she's on the line. Barbara won't be joining us very shortly, too. She still has it. But I know she was running late for another event. Big Singh from Digital Education Director at Ausgrade. And of course, I have my wonderful AIBC VIP leadership team. Piti Gaga, Piti, about please. Yeah, that's Piti there. Then we've also got Reet Kulwani, who's the Piti is the sports chair. Uh, Reet Kulwani is the Victoria VIP chair. Uh, we've got Tamanna Mumen. Uh, Tamanna is there. She's there. She is. She is the chair for Web Queensland, and we've got even Radhika Reddy there, who's the ACP president. So thank you everyone for being here today. Um, I'm just going to move forward very quickly because I'd love to hear others more than me speaking, but the global theme of this year's UN um, International Women's Day is Women in Leadership, Achieving an Equal Future in a COVID-19 World. And what a great theme for Australia India Business Council Women, we are constantly trying to facilitate this bilateral business relationship. Now, the, the interesting thing is very often I'm told, oh, India, then I can't be, Margaret, sorry, I completely forgot to introduce you. So I've got Margaret Fox, uh, Fox with me here, for, and Nick Hockley, of course, everybody knows, um, you know, when you're sitting too close, this is what happens, Nick. But I have a better introduction for him coming up very shortly. But Nick is the interim CEO of Cricket Australia. And on this day, the 8th of March, 2020, T20, when Australia India clashed for the finals, and Nick led that. And I think it was a historic day because I think that is the largest attendance ever for any women's sporting event in Australia internationally for cricket. So it's a great thank you so much and for being a huge male champion for anything that I mean, champion uh, for what we do. Um, interestingly, very often people ask me, oh, India, and give me a look that's like, oh, you've got a long way to go. And I'm like, no, I've got Kavita Singh here, who's the CEO of Bank of Baroda. And, you know, there are lots of other chief executives uh, leading various institutions and listed institutions. I want to just share one statistic. India stands in terms of senior management at 39% well over global average. As much as 47% of mid-market businesses in India now have women chief executive officers. And I, I, I'm 100% confident, though of course I'm not 100% sure, that this is way over any other country. So, you know, I think um, the time has come for us to be able to start changing perceptions to see what brand India is about. And that's something that we'll definitely be talking about. So, you know, the next thing I wanted to quickly touch base before we start is women in business, AIBC, what is it about? We have a vision which is very clear and very focused, it's 50-50. People ask me, what is 50-50? 50-50 is we want every business that is set up in the bilateral space to be owned or led by women. 50% of them should have women leaders or ownership. And I'm, must say, Sarushka is with me here today, that that's a KPI that we had set for ourselves. Today, AIBC walks the talk. We have 50% of our national leadership, which are women. Now, as an immediate national class chair, I could be on the board. I, 
I decided not to be on the board. If I was to continue on the board, that would be way over 50%. So my point is, we have absolutely, definitely, we try to walk the talk and you know, keep to our KPIs. So that's pretty much that I wanted to really talk about. Uh, more interestingly, I'm really pleased that today we're going to be sharing something we have been in dialogue and discussion about, and we wanted to make sure that we do it right, not just rush into uh, signing off a uh, piece of paper and nobody knows what to do. So this dialogue has been going on between Vicky, Flo, President, and myself for quite a few months, and we've run through all the items and agendas that we can. I mean, it's simple. We want to increase trade and business between the two countries. And we believe, um, and I have nothing against men, I'm sure they're very <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> Council General is sitting here, and Deputy Council General Sanjay and Nick, but I think women are very passionate, they're very sincere, they go that one extra step. And if I feel there has to be some movement in this relationship, it can happen, and it can start with the women. So, and women business owners and leaders. So. I believe this time for this MOU is just right, Chandi. Um, yeah. And uh, she's a national president of Vicky Flow. I myself have been a Flow member over the years. Uh, so I have good understanding of what happens, uh, what Vicky Flow do as also AIBC with. And we will be really connecting thousands of business owners, women business leaders and owners who are into exports, imports, manufacturing, uh, science, research, so much more with Australian business owners. So ladies and gentlemen, without much more ado, I really want to get straight into introducing our first speaker for today. It's going to be pretty simple. I just quickly give you before we have His Excellency coming on. Uh, so we're going to have a few remarks by some of our VIP guests that will throw open the business boardroom session just to make it a little bit more structured because there are also people online. Normally a business session would have been pretty much freewheeling, but because uh, there are virtual speakers too, I thought I might just bring you all in when you need to actually talk about something because I know each person's background and insight, that's what we want to capture. I just also want to let you know that there is a video recording happening and this is such an important event for us and there could be little clippings taken of each person when they speak and that would, uh, we would definitely share it with you before it goes into social media, okay? So, Without much ado, I'm going to read, uh, now invite His Excellency uh, High Commissioner Sarma. And I think everybody knows Sarma very well, High Commissioner. Um, yeah. However, for protocol's sake, I would still like to introduce him because we have a few new people here. So uh, he completed his BA Honours and MA in Political Science from Delhi University, joined the Indian Foreign Service in, 19, uh, in, in 1986 worked in Ministry of External Affairs as Under Secretary and Director Central Asia. His overseas assignments included Indian missions in Russia, Ukraine, Hong Kong, Pakistan, UK. He has been an ambassador to India in uh, Uzbekistan and High Commissioner of India in Fiji. Additionally served as Officer of Special Duty in the Information Technology Department and of the State of Andhra Pradesh, Hyderabad, India. He was also the Joint Secretary External Relations in the Department of Atom Atomic Energy, Government of India, and was the Secretary of West in the Ministry of External Affairs until November 2019. That's when we were very fortunate to have His Excellency High Commissioner, Mr. Sarma, joining us uh, in Australia. So over to you, uh, High Commissioner, uh, if you could share your thinking on what it means, uh, this bilateral business space, contextual women, and on the International Women's Day 2021. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Sheba, for uh, setting the tone. And uh, it's really wonderful to join you all. I see many, many familiar faces uh, today. Uh, during my stay in Australia, I have come to uh, know many of you personally. I have deep respect for each one of you. And meeting today in this format on 8th March is very special. So let me straight away wish you a good day and a very happy International Women's Day. I personally been celebrating this uh, Women's Day 8th March since I remember 1988 and I joined the service in 1986. 
So every year it is uh, so special. And as you said, uh, Sheba, uh, last year we were at Melbourne when the two women's teams, India and Australia, were uh, battling it out uh, on the uh, you know, cricket uh, front. And it was so special you know, that really this uh, women's cricket had come of age to find such a large audience. And uh, this is really a reflection of our relationship and a reflection of uh, the way women have uh, broken through to uh, you know, touch every single frontier, to reach uh, every single uh, you know, pr uh, area that can be uh, you know, uh, conquered. So it is a very, very, uh, you know, very special day in every way for me personally, and uh, in general that globally we are recognizing the uh, you know, contribution of women who are so special. Um, let me congratulate uh, AIBC and uh, PILO, Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce and Ladies Organization. Uh, you know, it couldn't be a better start to uh, our relations, uh, you know, this year uh, on Women's Day, uh, you know, uh, you know, in this way that we are having a business side where women are coming together to uh, take our uh, bilateral ties further. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, last year was very special to uh, Prime Minister Morrison and Prime Minister Modi. They took our relations to a higher level and, uh, you know, the comprehensive strategic partnership. And that has many, many uh, dimensions. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, it's a business aspect that needs uh, serious uh, attention and anything that can further, uh, you know, our business activity that is to be welcome. And uh, this, uh, this uh, PILO and uh, AIBC initiative, I think is very, very uh, timely. Uh, I think I would uh, leave it uh, to, uh, you know, the discussions to bring out the business aspects, the cooperation, but really it's, uh, you know, this is a day which is very special and uh, it's a day to uh, celebrate and to uh, recognize that, uh, you know, we must uh, in a way enjoy the achievements and at the same time, there are many things which need uh, serious attention as well. So if I uh, look at ourselves, you know, on this day and be a little thoughtful about, uh, you know, how we have uh, moved on as far as the women's aspect is concerned, you know, India has its own rich uh, traditions and women have traditionally in our culture, they've had a very, very important place. And whatever you, know, you see other things, uh, you could say that distortions. So truly now you find that, uh, uh, you know, we are uh, now, uh, you know, making such huge strides as far as women are concerned. In addition to the other things that Shiba you mentioned, uh, I was just uh, noting that, uh, you know, in India, we have uh, the maximum number of commercial pilots, uh, you know, from uh, women, uh, from amongst women in the world. 13% of total female airline pilots come from India. So that's an amazing uh, achievement. And, uh, you know, it gives me such uh, joy. I also noticed that uh, earlier this year, India's Supreme Court had ruled that all women are now eligible for permanent commission in the armed forces. What a wonderful thing, you know, that, uh, then I notice uh, it's not often nice to talk about uh, defense aspect, but then, uh, you know, it's one more barrier gone. I, I notice uh, Tessie Tom, Thomas heads our uh, missile defense program. So that's uh, something that, uh, uh, again, something which uh, we celebrate. The most complex aspects of our space program, they're handled uh, by our women scientists. And, you know, when we say India is the biggest producer of movies, uh, then, Bollywood is catching up with this also. They are finding that women-centric uh, movies are, you know, uh, they have a greater chance of success and you find increasingly several of the uh, movies where you say uh, Dangal, Mangalyan, several of these movies, they have been uh, very nice stories and also been commercial hits. So that shows that our society is uh, changing. On uh, another side that uh, today I had a chance to reflect uh, in a long career that, and here I, I am in the midst of uh, uh, some exciting developments in India-Australia relationship. But when you look at uh, this, there is one thing which often gets uh, uh, no neglected or lost sight of. On this side, we have Her Excellency uh, Mary Spain uh, uh, guiding this uh, relationship. Again, a lady of uh, you know uh, great uh, stature and uh, widely respected. 
and Foreign Secretary on this side, Francis Adamson, another lady, uh, you know, on this side. But uh, believe me that uh, we match uh, them, uh, you know, the, our entire Oceania division uh, from top to bottom, they're all women from Secretary downwards, Secretary East uh, downwards, down to the Under Secretary, all women team. And look what a wonderful job uh, they're doing. Um, so that's something which uh, we will celebrate once again. Um, I would I would say uh, you know that uh, I, on a personal note that uh, I'm a father of one child, a girl child, and I've you know and I notice uh, you know if I say from on the basis of impressions that uh, you know nowadays in India the middle class is also changing, and it's it doesn't really matter if you're you know if you have a girl child or a male child, child is a child, and once it happened that in my long career you did uh, speak about some moments uh, in my long career, I was in one mission and uh, we had a picnic. And uh, when uh, I took my daughter along, we went to this picnic of our colleagues. It was in Islamabad actually. And uh, when I noticed, I looked around, there were only girl childs. I didn't see a single boy uh, you know, in that group. All my colleagues only had girl childs. How it happened, I don't know. But uh, these are all uh, moments we are now no longer surprised that uh, you know, in India also, in middle class, uh, you know, they, it is a completely changed. Our workplace also, I find in the foreign service uh, colleagues, you know, uh, each batch, you know, is uh, you have a huge representation of women and we never ask the question. We have to learn to take it for granted. You have a woman boss or a colleague or a junior and they, they just are expected to perform. But on the other hand, as I said, I've been celebrating 8 March since uh, almost 1988, 89. And uh, I find that, uh, uh, you know, while we take it for granted, we must also, uh, you know, give a thought, spare a thought uh, that our women have to work extra hard to prove themselves. And, they, you know, that's sometimes uh, unfair. Now, we, uh, you know, are, we have enjoy all the benefits, but when it comes to women, whenever we sometimes grudge them the benefits that they rightly and richly deserve. So I hope that, uh, your successes in life, your successes in your career, and your successes in business uh, in this relationship between uh, FICI and AIBC, that uh, that will be something which will inspire uh, all of us to recognize that how far we have uh, come and how our societies have got transformed. And uh, really in many ways uh, that we really should look the day when we cease to look at uh, this aspect and we just look at uh, just being uh, you know successful being good being that that i think we would have arrived but until then let's work very hard to uh, you know encourage our women colleagues we uh, greatly appreciate your uh, efforts at uh, you know achieving success and building india australia partnership so let me thank uh, aibc and uh, fiki for setting up this on uh, 8 march and uh, let me wish you uh, good health, happiness, and uh, lots of success. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And um, as you rightly said, I wasn't aware of the commercial pilots, but I think that's an amazing figure, which I'm going to quickly add into my list. <laughs> and uh, it, is, it is really, an excellent day to get together, 8th of March. I wasn't even sure whether people would meet me, but somehow it all came together so well. And thank you, Nick, for being here too. Uh, so I'm going to just move into the next uh, thing where we were requesting Council General um, of Sydney, Mr. Manish Gupta, everybody knows him. Uh, would you like to kind of uh, welcome the guests and say a few words on this occasion? Thank you very much. And also about the MOU, your remarks on the MOU. What a privilege for us, you know, for all of us, my consulate team here to host you. There's such a distinguished galaxy of women you know who accent in various walks of life. And as Honorable Aitam was saying, you know, let me perfectly make the point. When we talk about the Australia India corridor, I think women have left an indelible impact. Honorable High Commissioner referred to the Honorable Minister team, but let me also point out my two counterparts in 
कोलकाता आणि चेन्नई त्या रोज सगळे मेन स्टेट डायरेक्टर Australian super, you know, they are one of the biggest investors again. Go here, so that speaks, you know, the ease also by which yeah. the both sides correlate. Yes, I would really thank you, honourable leader of this position, because mm-hmm. your presence here means a lot for us. Because it is a symbol that both sides across the political spectrum we are deeply invested in advancing this partnership, and that's what you know. Our interaction with across the board, the political leadership, I think that means a lot. Your constant words of encouragement to the Indian Australian community, you know, we deeply appreciate. And thank you so much. Now, on the MOU side, frankly, this is the first time I'm very thankful to Janu Kupen, you know, he is joining us all the way from I India know. and early morning. Early morning, yeah. seven a.m., yeah. seven thirty. <laughs> But I think the timing perhaps could be better than this. Because as the Honorable High Commissioner was referring, we are on the cusp of a very important business opportunity. The last year, despite the pandemic, we took this momentous development in this relationship. Of course, Piquet, you know, starting to the end, we are thankful to you. <laughs> that is the Women World Cup and the Piquet series. But after the strategic partnership, comprehensive strategic partnership, I think. Our trade and business ties are destined for a much higher place. Yes. And this MOU will really provide the support, dedicated framework that are already available here in Australia as well as in India to the women entrepreneurs. To really help them to deep dive into the trade and economic aspects of this relationship. I wish everyone all the very, very best. And I'm pretty confident that next year when we are going to meet in this, we have a lot more women entrepreneurs. Absolutely. <laughs> We'll have another KPI. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for uh, sharing your thoughts. And this is, as you said, a very momentous day for us. And that MOU will definitely connect lots of women at the grassroots level because AIBC is not just in one state. We are across every state. Uh, we've got management committees in every state. And the, the women in business chapters pretty much represented everywhere. When it comes to Piki, and I know Chandvi will talk about it, Flo, I used to be a member, and they're in every state. And the number of women business members and entrepreneurs they have is amazing. So this is going to be a great platform for Connect. Thank you so much. And now it is my real privilege for introducing, and I've never seen you as a politician, so I must make that <laughs> very clear. I see her as an amazing leader, and um, a leader who really supports every side, whether it's a man or a woman, it doesn't matter. What she supports is commitment. What she supports is, supports is loyalty, honesty, and really what I've seen the way passion in whatever you do. You go over over and above, not 100, but 110%. So for us, it's a privilege to have you here and uh, Judy. And uh, over the years, I've seen how you have supported women in business, women's empowerment, and especially economic empowerment. 
So over to you if you wanted to share a few things with us. Thank you, Shiva. And uh, can I start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land here in Australia? For those in India, uh, it's important that we acknowledge uh, the First Nations people. Um, they've owned this land in Australia for some 40 to 50,000 years. Um, thank you very much, Shiva, for the opportunity to be here on this special day. Hi, Commissioner, I acknowledge you and I hope we get to see you in Sydney soon. Of course, Consul General, thank you for the support you give our Indian Australian community uh, and also the role you play in bilateral relations. Um, I also just want to acknowledge Shiva, of course, uh, from AIBC and the Women's Chapter, and also Janabi uh, from Vicky. It's really good to see you on screen. I'm sorry we can't meet in person, but can I say when our borders reopen here in Australia, whenever that is, um, I will be uh, heading to India. So I hope we get to meet. Uh, we get to meet soon. Look, I wanted to come along today on International. Women's Day just to show my support to both organisations. I think it's incredibly important that we recognise um, where we've come from as women, uh, but the challenge is still ahead. And uh, that means that we as women have a role to play in uh, growing the relationship between the two countries, India and Australia. Bilateral trade is worth about $30 billion. Uh, and it would be so easy to leave it to Vicky, and it'd be so easy to leave it to uh, AIBC uh, to uh, work to support that relationship. But what the two of you are doing is saying that women have a greater role in that. And uh, you're stepping up, stepping forward, and uh, as the International Women's Day theme says, you are choosing to challenge, which is just terrific. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I know there are lots of other speakers, but thank you very much for uh, both Shiva and Janabi for um, just having the courage to do this, having the tenacity to see this through, and also the passion uh, to be true leaders. So um, in recognition of that, I would like to um, present this uh, certificate from the New South Wales Parliament to Sheba, which just acknowledges uh, in New South Wales the role that Sheba is playing in uh, signing this oh MOU. So thank, thank you, you so much. We thank you. Thank you. you have to leave by two and you know we will definitely you know while we continue we'll just so that everybody knows she has really pulled time out from this important day to be with us today and she may have to slip out she's a lot of other parliamentary commitments uh so i'm going to just move on to the next where i'm going to actually perhaps invite um uh picky um Ch chanvi Kukan. Mm -hmm. she is the national president of picky flow She's also a businesswoman in her own right. So Chandvi, would you be kind enough to come online and share your thoughts, <laughs> more specifically about what it means for the implications of this MOU for Australia and India? Over to you, Chandvi. Thank you very much. A very good afternoon to all in Australia. High Commissioner of India, Mr. Gitesh Sharma, Judy McKay, MP, Leader of Opposition, Council General of India, Sydney, Mr. Manish Gupta, Council General of Australia, Kolkata Rowan Answorth, and uh, the other esteemed members on this group today. I am uh, it's absolute delight to be able to address you from India on a momentous day such as this, on the International Women's Day, and to speak with and address AIBC Women in Business International Boardroom Session today. As a 37th National President of Flow, we are the women's wing of FICI, and our organization is known to be the oldest business chamber for women in South Asia. We have a collective membership of 8,000 members across the country and beyond our membership we would say we are the voice of the women whose lives we have impacted directly or indirectly over the last three decades. 
I'd like to thank Sheba to having made this possible. Sheba and I have been talking for many months now on to bring this collaboration closer. When I took over as the national president last year, our vision was to be able to talk to women across the globe and to have a tie up a sort of a fellowship of understanding of trade possibilities and trade potential that we should take up in our own hands and try to forge together. We have spoken and uh, taken the B2B sessions and networking with our members and countries of the Netherlands, Chile, uh, Myanmar, Vietnam, today with Australia. And this is some, this is our <clears throat> a potential which is, will go beyond my one year term as president. And I know that this is something both our organizations will continue to forge on. I would like to say here that talking on Women's Day today, the theme was women in leadership, achieving an equal future in a COVID-19 world. And today with all the, the, the position of the women in the world, in leadership, <clears throat> in trade, in any other, in every work that women does in the formal and the informal sector, we're here to recognize and celebrate women. And we uh, would like to talk about the, the aspirational market that India holds, are being 49% in a 1.3 billion population with young demographics and a rising demand driven by digitization which has made it so important for businesses across the world. We are the second largest uh, internet user in the world. And women have taken to the uh, e-commerce and internet businesses like never before. You know, um, I mean, early last year, <clears throat> trade, tourism, and taste of Australia was what had dominated the India-Australia business exchange. And that was one of the largest trade missions to India in the last five years, and the 120 Australian business delegation which had, who had visited India to, to celebrate and expand on the Indian opportunities. And to address the gaps and the possibilities that exist in the Australia-India relationship, Australia's India Economic Strategy 2035 was launched way back in 2018. And the strategy then was to set that target for India to become one of Australia's top three export markets to make India the third largest destination in Asia for Australian outward investment and to bring India into the inner circle of Australia's strategic partnership. Since then the world did change and we had the COVID upon us and everything seemed to have come to a standstill. But at Flow, what we tried to do was address the, the shortfalls and the Instead of coming to a standstill, we embraced the new normal and we found more and more opportunities to work online. And in that, we, uh, we, spoke, we took up this Women on Seven of Seven Continents initiative instead. That instead of waiting for our physical meetings to go to each other's countries and to talk and listen to each other, let us at least start on the online platform. Let us make this beginning and uh, take women into the value chain uh, of sustainable businesses, sustainable uh, relationship building and see how we will come forward in, in forging these links with the business interests that other women of flow have in various sectors. And we can do the ideal matching with the women of your country, your organization, that would be the first step forward. And when the border does open up, with Australia and India, we will be there ahead of time. So though much of the focus <clears throat> is now in, on a more inclusive trade, where benefits will be shared more widely. And uh, that is why it is also important at this time, while we are still in lockdown mode, to be able to uh, work together and uh, work through the existing barriers which are there, let us identify. What are the tools required for crafting a more gender responsive trade policies between our countries? We would say that um, coming to 
what we talk about, the women's empowerment, and what we think are the three pillars on which it rests, that we have to increase women in the workforce. We have to create enabling environment for women entrepreneurs so that women can more effectively contribute towards the economy. There is no question that um, to move the country's economy forward, it has to have the role of the women has to be recognized and equally so. And this is the time for us to make sure, to ensure that our voices are heard and our opinions are taken into, uh, into cognizance when anything is being crafted, any policies, of the government on any vertical, women are there. And so it's gender responsive, a gender equal uh, policy of the government is vital for us. And I we just signed um, an MOU with the UN Women uh, last week, where we've taken upon ourselves as a business uh, chamber to promote, to promote the seven women empowerment principles, which are propagated by the UN Women. And that the WEPs, as they call it, is something that uh, should resonate from every woman's um, organization to every corporation in the country at every level, that these uh, the spirit of uh, women's empowerment will truly rest when it comes from the boardrooms and the small offices and the small businesses, that uh, it should be enshrined, not just by legislation, but in spirit of how women, the WEPs need to be a part of our daily workings, a part of our business relationships across countries and within our country. Now, briefly about um, our... Uh, organization during the COVID times, we had sought to work, to continue working at the three levels. And we managed to do that even on the online platform and whatever offline we could uh, 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 manage to do. That in rural India, Flo had the village adoption program where we sought to concentrate on a microcosm of women at that level. And our chapters across 17, our 17 chapters across the country worked on adopting a village and concentrating on upskilling the women there. In the urban sector, we worked on adopting a ITI, the Industrial Training Institutes of the Government, and work on concentrating on improving, mentoring young, uh, young girls, young boys in that sphere. And at the corporate level, we tried to work closely with the women corporate directors programs so that our women were trained to be company uh, corporate directors. And since the government has mandated that women need to be on the board of for each company, that the women of flow would fit the bill. And those have been the way we've tried to work on <clears throat> what we call our three-pronged initiative, which is the flow, three Cs of competency, capacity, and confidence building for women at these three levels. And uh, with that, we think there was a beyond, that was what we did within our country and outside beyond it at the borders that we looked at, especially in this new normal, it was trade between our countries in this, which is the way we wanted to take this forward and forge ahead. And so I'm very, uh, coming back to the initiative today and the MOU that we want to sign on such a momentous occasion and auspicious day of uh, women's, uh, women's rights, of women's uh, equal rights, women's human rights, women's uh, equal opportunities. This is the day that we want to celebrate together. And I'm very happy to once again say that this worldwide forum that we wanted to do is today going to happen. And we are joining hands with Australia and, and have the same of you with the Australia India Business Council, AIBC. We'd like to say that um, once these borders open up, our delegations will be visiting each other. And, but besides that, this is something which will, the networking can begin right away. And our, uh, we will set up the, the sector, the sectoral interest of our members and those, the matchmaking can start happening on the online platform till the country opens up. So 
We'd like to conclude here by quoting Gloria Steinem today, who had once explained that the story of the women's struggle for equality really belongs to no single feminist, nor to any one organization, but to the collective efforts of all who care about human rights. And we want to be on an equal footing, and I look forward to the, to the future when we will no longer talk about women leaders, but just leaders. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, we formally do the MOU. I'm going to sign, I'm going to sign, send, uh, you know, uh, actually get our Consul General here in uh, Sydney to be the witness. If you can sign there, Mr. Gupta. And I don't know. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I would love to bring Council General, another Council General who's present with us today, uh, Roman uh, Ainsworth from Kolkata, uh, representing the federal government of Australia. Roman, if you could come in and perhaps share your views about the MOU and the implications it has for the two countries, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, in fact, Shiba and Janabi for the invitation and for this excellent initiative today on International Women's Day. I'm so pleased to be part of this. And uh, congratulations to AIBC Women, uh, the, the Women in Business chapter, and to the Fiki Flow, uh, mm -hmm. which will see this strengthening of ties. And uh, it, you know, it's a great way forward. So really pleased to be here and part of this. And um, I have to say, it's um, quite an interesting time to be looking at women's rights. I think uh, in the year of COVID, there's been such a huge and disproportional impact on women in business uh, because it's, it's women who hold, who've been really borne the brunt of uh, COVID unemployment. You know, a lot of the people who hold kind of fairly marginal uh, jobs in society are women. And so the impact has been greater on them uh, in terms of loss of jobs, but also in terms of uh, taking on the burden of child sharing when schools closed or childcare centres closed. It was women who took up the cudgels to look after family, to take on the homeschooling. I think uh, more than the men did, uh, statistics will show. Uh, and of course, all of that is unpaid labor. So I think it's really important that, uh, you know, we particularly address during COVID times, the issues for women. Um, but it's not just now, of course, we have to address it all the time. And uh, I think, um, we are trying to do that in foreign affairs and trade, um, looking at the way that we work with other countries and looking at our own internal settings as well, trying to lead by example and provide a better working place for women. And to that end, um, you might be aware that uh, we conducted a review back in 2015 and started a Women in Leadership program to promote the uh, equality, gender equality within foreign affairs and trade. And I think it's useful to look at that um, as a, an example, just one, and there are probably many more, but do you know, an example of what kind of concrete actions can be taken by organizations to assist with gender equality. And uh, of course that um, initiative was put forward by a woman, our secretary, Frances Adamson, who recognized that organizations that didn't have gender equality were missing out, you know, obviously women being 50% of the talent pool. Um, so the changes were, were wide ranging and, and I particularly want to mention it because this Women's Day we've uh, had a review of how far we've got since 2015 
and we've launched a new edition of Women in Leadership, a new strategy to take it for, forward further to 2025. But looking at what we did and uh, what we achieved, so it's just a few of the statistics um, in one of the things we really concentrated on was flexible working arrangements because, as I just mentioned, women take on the greater burden often of childcare responsibilities and so forth. Um, we looked at ways that would enable uh, flexible and remote work so that women could, uh, and men as well, of course, obviously, it, it applies to everybody in the department, but so that parents could uh, fulfill their childcare responsibilities more easily. Um, and we also looked at gender targets for the recruitment of senior ex executives, the introduction of unconscious bias training, um, and embedding inclusive leadership practices in everyday work. So these were our goals. And uh, in 2017, I can say that 28% of DFAT staff had flexible work arrangements, but the proportion of women doing that was 79%. Um, nowadays in 2020, well, where the, the, the most recent survey was done just at the end of last year, uh, between 30 and 40% of DFAT staff were working remotely on leave or undertaking duties away from the office. 57% uh, were female and 43% were male. Presumably a lot of that is due to COVID, uh, but it also reflects the fact that we introduced an if not, why not policy, whereby if people needed to work flexibly, it was the onus was on the leadership of DFAT to say, why would that not be possible rather than the reverse and trying to indicate why it should happen. Um, the gender pay gap has narrowed. So in 2015, it was 12.4%. Now it is, uh, eight, well, in 2019, I beg your pardon, it was 8.7%. But I think that's a credible change. And here's one that's close to my heart on parental leave. 77.8% um, of people who took parental leave were women. And more recently, that has become 75.3%. Now, that might seem like a very small change. And of course, you'd say, well, of course, it's the women who take parental leave. But one of my views is the issue with women being promoted and moving through the ranks is that they take big chunks of time off the child rearing and child bearing for having children and then staying home afterwards to look after them. And it's just my personal view, but I really think that men should have to take off the same amount of time for their parental leave that women are accorded as well. Uh, not sure if that's gonna catch on, that's just my view, but I think it's an important thing. And looking forward, um, we are now making leaders more accountable for setting an inclusive tone in the workplace to improve internal transparency of, in of our performance on gender. So looking at statistics, excuse me, constantly and looking back and seeing how we're doing, measuring our improvements. And, um, and it's up to us again, to break down the barriers that staff has identified as holding back women in the workplace. So that's moving forward. Um, but one of the big issues for me living forward is we've done quite well in promoting people and ensuring that uh, for example, 44% of heads of mission and post overseas are now women. So we're moving those figures up and in the executive uh, area as well, there are more women. But a, a, another one of my hobby horses, and this one we are taking up in DFAT, is to ensure that more men are included in the lower ranks of the department, not by stopping them from being promoted, but just by recruiting men into being personal assistants these kind of positions that are traditionally held by women, they ought to see gender equality as well, just as much as in, in the upper levels. Uh, and so that's something we are working on as well. Women's health are no longer taboo. Um, parental leave for men is accepted and encouraged. I think we could go further there. Um, and the idea now is to maintain and embed the gains that we've made as well as keep improving on them. So, uh, 
We want we are wanting to ensure our inclusive and supportive and constructive leaders consistently demonstrate gender equality and that we are held accountable for doing so. And we're also working to make sure we embed those qualities in our global network of overseas posts. Um, and I think that's important too, because there, you know, there are huge differences around the world. Um, we, we want to, within our own consulates, lead by example. Um, so that's, that's sort of some ideas of what we're doing. I agree very much with uh, His Excellency the High Commissioner when he said that women often have to work harder to achieve the same success as men. And uh, if that is true, then there's a really easy solution to having really great employees in your company, and that is employ women because they're working harder and they're achieving harder. To, uh, you know, they're achieving greater excellence. Um, so, you know, there, there's a simple solution, number one. Um, I'd also like to mention, I completely agree with, uh, with Sheba on, um, and, and his excellency mentioned as well, on the idea of uh, sport and women in sport and how we can promote that. Um, Australia is hosting the uh, FIFA World Cup, the, sorry, the Women's World Cup, yeah. Um, so that's gonna be a big issue here in Kolkata where everyone's big soccer fans. Um, but also I'm pleased to say that the, uh, the cricket team, for example, it may seem a small thing, but the Australian cricket team no longer exists. There is only the men's cricket team and the women's cricket team. So when we refer to the Australian cricket team, you have to specify which one you mean. Um, it may be small, but I think that's really helpful. Those kind of changes make a big difference. So wrapping up, I'd just like to say congratulations again. And thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this Women's Day event. Thank you so much, uh, and as you said, there should be more um, men employed at certain uh, for certain jobs, which we normally see only women in. And uh, and finally, you know, there should be just leaders, as Janvi said. There should be no women and men. It's really the talent that should come through. But thank you. It's very early in the morning. Um, I can see it's a bit warm in India. I can see the fan worrying away. It's such a nice sight. Can I tell you? I'm from Kolkata. <laughs> so, <laughs> excellent thank you so much for the sake of time we might move on and i'm going to request rose and thank you rose we've known each other for a while now and i have to say australian super actually was one of our corporate members is one of our corporate members at aibc i have to say australian super has been the first one who decided india has opportunities and thank you rose for also uh, we have uh, uh, your head of uh, investments joining us for the infrastructure which rose has very kindly organized for us for the infrastructure meeting australian super is playing a key role in how india is now uh, going forward especially with the investments but more importantly even here in terms of how you have been interacting. I mean, I know the, even with the diaspora and so on. Over to you for a few of your thoughts in this area. Thank you, Sheba. Um, good afternoon, and it's a really a huge delight to be celebrating International Women's Day with you all. And I also wanted to warmly acknowledge the distinguished guests present, including His Excellency, the High Commissioner of India and the Council Generals. And also, I particularly want to thank the AIBC Women in Business chapter and, of course, Sheba, who's just absolutely wonderful, um, for the invitation to attend. I just wanted to firstly say that the AIBC has done a really outstanding job of fostering and enabling bilateral trade, commerce and investment between Australia and India. And in recent years, we've seen really remarkable growth in our trading relationship which has been fueled by close historical ties between the two countries. Australian Super is Australia's largest superannuation fund, and we manage over $200 billion on behalf of 2.3 million members. Importantly, on International Women's Day, I wanted to mention that 50% of our executive is female, and we have very strong gender equality policies and practices in place. And that includes extending to the companies that we invest in and trying to push to ensure that they have good gender diversity representation. 
because that leads to better performance of those companies. India is a really increasingly attractive investment destination for foreign institutional investors like Australian Super, and it's driven by the country's strong growth potential, positive demographics, and continued economic development. We are really working on deepening our business relations and investment ties with India. And last year, our Chief Investment Officer, Mark Delaney, met with Indian Prime Minister Modi and his advisors. The Indian government launched the National Investment and Infrastructure Fund, or the NIIF, back in 2015. And that was about attracting foreign investment in Indian infrastructure to power the country's economic development by building motorways, high-speed railways, and efficient ports. And we were really proud in August 2019 to announce our plans to invest US $1 billion in the NIIF Master Fund. It's a significant investment, and it's consistent with Australian Super's long-term partnership approach to investing in global markets, where we can leverage those deep local market expertise that's available in countries like India. We're really looking forward to participating in a strong pipeline of projects across a range of sectors, and we wanna to continue to actively engage to strengthen bilateral business relations between Australia and India. Thank you all, and I wish you all your very much a success in your future mission. Thanks. Thank you so much. For there's no question that Australian Super has been a great support, a supporter of the Australian India Business Council. And I remember my first conversation years ago when I said, well, how do we fit in? And then suddenly it was so seamless where the two countries need each other. Uh, and uh, India, I think, in order to really accelerate its growth, needs to invest more and more in its infrastructure. And this is where we see a great partnership. Australian Super and you've been absolutely supportive over the years. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for organizing your head of investment to join us on the 11th. So this is, uh, thank you so much. And I might now move in for a quick minute to Nick. Nick, if you wanted to share, and, I let, and then I'm going to throw open some questions quickly to everybody. I know their experience and expertise and draw you in, but if you could just share, for me, it's, and I know for uh, two more members here, Sonia, as well as uh, I think we've got Preeti there. All three of us um, were your brand ambassadors for T20, and uh, we will never ever forget the 8th of March 2020. And I think um, with pride, I must say, uh, you have achieved something really amazing in the international world, international field platform, which has never happened before. So what do you to share some of your thoughts on this with everybody? Sure. No, uh, thank you, Steve. And can I say what a, what a privilege it is to be here with, with so many friends. And uh, uh, thank you to the, the High Commissioner, Consul General uh, Shiva. Um, uh, AIBC has always been uh, so, so supportive. And I think today I reflect that um, you know, sport is a it's actually a big it's a big business, but as much as that, um, it is such an intrinsic part of society, and um, cricket in particular uh, is such a, an intrinsic part of the relationship between um, India and, and, and Australia. So, you know, I think we were all very privileged to be involved in um, in last year's World Cup. I think um, really it remains the last. Major sporting event before, before the pandemic, which has in many ways given it um, you know, additional significance. It's to this day, it, it, it is it's the biggest sport, uh, sporting crowd at any sporting event in 2020. Um, uh, and for that, we'll be eternally grateful. And um, you know, I think the other thing about sport is that it um, very much brings, brings people together. And um, certainly the ambition to our ambition throughout that event was very much um, to give uh, equal billing and accept nothing less, nothing short of 50-50, of nothing yeah. short of, uh, of that absolute, um, absolute equality. And, and the hope is that um, moments like that demonstrate to uh, you know, the business community, but you know more broadly to little girls and little boys that, uh, 
you know, we should, whether it's being an elite cricketer, whether it's being a scientist, whether it's being a journalist, whether it's being, you know, you know going into politics, that um, we should, you know, all follow our dreams and all, all have um, equal opportunities. Um, so certainly, I think, you know, for those that work in sports and cricket, we understand that a lot, that it comes with lots of profile, and with that comes um, an immense amount of responsibility. And um, I've just come from the Sydney Cricket Ground uh, this morning. Um, this year's theme of, in, of International Women's Day is Choose the Challenge. And um, would you believe in Australia uh, in 2021, there are 73 uh, sculptures of Australian male uh, cricketers, um, and there are zero of um, female counterparts. So whilst Last year was a great example of what can be achieved. We still have a long, long way to go. Um, and we're very grateful for to um, Venues New South Wales and the City Cricket Ground Trust today going to commission um, the first sculpture of a female cricket text. Um, um, we, won't, we won't rest until um, we won't rest until there are the same number. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm going to say it's a great privilege to be, be here. Um, I think the other, um, I think I agree with the comments around the, you know, the given the pandemic, we keep our eye on the ball, excuse the pun, even more so. Um, so um, just yesterday was the Indian women's cricket team played their first uh, first match since uh, for, for a year, and um, you know, as, as we know, the male counterparts have played a number of series. So uh, I think now is the time. Um, in cricket, um, and we, we also have a 50 50 exec, executive at Cricket Australia. Now is the time that we um, we need to make sure that we are, you know, we're, we're over investing to, um, to address the, the current inequality. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. And I'm going to take Sanushka in. She's not just here as a national vice chair of the IDC, but also representing the national chair, Jim Barbies. But more interestingly, when we started, when I founded the Women in Business chapter, Sanushka was one of our original members. Uh, so uh, she's really been for a thick and thin with me. So Sanushka, over to you. So thanks, Shiva. And uh, I'll keep it brief. I'm used to charging my time six and eight. Yes, <laughs> we know that. <laughs> and there's many more to come up to me. Um, but on behalf of Jim uh, and myself, congratulations to you and to Janvi. This is exciting for us at the ABC. It's, it's a combination of many, many months and years of effort. Uh, and we look forward to, to seeing the fruits of this relationship coming together, particularly uh, in terms of the extension we hope it's going to have into cities and towns in India uh, and in rural and regional parts of Australia that we haven't yet been able to touch. And I think that's probably the part that I'm most excited about. Um, but other than that, there's just a couple of things I just want to, to point out. So Manish, in uh, response to something you said, two of our state president for women is actually three. three. <laughs> <laughs> and so we've got a big uh, state representation, and three of them are, are, are women. Oh, yes. yeah, South Australia, the ACT, and Victoria. So we're very proud of that. And June particularly is a keen advocate for equality uh, at the ABC. Um, and the second response I'm going to give is to Rowan, actually. So I think the, the shift in terms of parental uh, responsibility, et cetera, is coming. I think it's a, a, it's a next gen shift. So, so we're seeing it a lot more at law firms. So we've got lawyers who are uh, now, our male lawyers are taking four months of leave when their wives are going back into work. Uh, and that's exciting for us. So it is coming. Um, but other than that, I'm excited that we're here and there are many others coming behind me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So what I'd like to do actually is for the sake of time, and I know we were meant to finish it about uh, roughly another seven or eight minutes, but I'm okay to spend another 15 minutes instead of eight, but I'd really like to bring and hear a few of you who are here today. So we might get started with Deborah yourself. And you were, uh, you're a board member, you were the India of Women's Media, and you had long chats about some of the experiences. I'd love to for you to share something about doing business with India. 
uh, we, uh, for the sake of time, we might just keep it to about two minutes or so. Yeah. Sure, because it's uh, two years living there, it's uh, a lot of stories I could tell. And uh, just um, while we're on it, Deborah, uh, if you remember, I did share that I would like you to come uh, for a standalone session to share the doing business with India sure. experience. So we are going to have a session where Deborah is actually going to be leading that and actually sharing a more in-depth insight um, uh, during that session. But over to you. So I think what I'll um, just start off with briefly is um, I was actually very honoured um, in 2007, the CEO of Woolworths Australia, um, they had done a joint venture with Tata in India to open um, 200 electronic stores. And um, there were many thousands of male executives who would have liked to have been invited to run the business in India, but I got the opportunity to do that. And it was the most amazing experience of my life. And I tell a lot of people say, but how do you live in India? Well, I've been married to an Indian for 43 years. So that did make it a little easier. Um, I got married in Calcutta, cold cutter, um, in, in 1977. And I've been visiting India every couple of years, taking our children back. And I've now taken my grandchildren back to India because I really want them to know how wonderful their heritage is. But then, when you actually land in India and it's not a visit and you're not being treated by the family um, to wonderful food at home and great experiences and you're actually doing business in India, it can be a lot tougher. Um, and I'm sure Rowan can attest to that. Um, however, my experience there, um, when I landed first store in Juhu, um, 42 stores within two years. A lot of people say you cannot get things done in India. I say that's a nonsense. I say you have to work with people in India. You have to share your visions together is the most important thing. But if you have got good combined vision and a good strategy, uh, particularly on execution, even though there is um, Indian stretchable time, so ISP, <laughs> so a lot of the time everybody will say we can get that done in that time. Um, but, of course, we miss many, many deadlines, but we still open 42 stores within two years. When I came back from India in 2008, I continued to run the business um, from Australia. I became the uh, first uh, woman to run a retail brand for Woolworths. So I was given Dick Smith um, the brand, which was going to be sold off, but I had to get it ready for sale. I still continue to run the business um, from Australia um, and in, for India. And um, I must actually tell everybody here today that I became a much better leader from my experience in India. It taught me to be patient. It taught me to listen. It taught me to not take myself too seriously because you just can't in India. And it actually taught me to be the great leader that I think I became. I then went on to um, run Fantastic Furniture and then last year retired as group CEO of five brands, Plush, Fantastic, OMF, Snooze and Freedom Furniture. So my, I would say my experience in India actually taught me to be a great leader overall. I would encourage anybody who is thinking about doing business in India to not just think about it, do something about it. I had a early international woman's drinks uh, evening at my home on Friday evening, and every woman that was there was doing business in India. They run retail businesses, they're importers of products from all over India. And every one of them, because I said I was going to mention it today, every one of them said, I can't wait till I can go back and work with my partners in India. So my recommendation is if you're thinking about business and doing business in India, don't think about it. Do it. Thank you so much, Deborah. That's what I'm doing. brands that you have led, which have really done well. So I might actually get uh, Professor Rina Sajjbar. Rina, if you can share very briefly what your key message takeout might be. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thanks. Go ahead. And uh, I hope I'm not taking up uh, you know, too much of your time this afternoon. I just wanted to be able to make that connection um, for, for people who uh, probably don't know. But I was born in Mumbai. That's uh, where my mother uh, still is and, and kind of really was uh, back home. But I think one of the really sort of points that all of us want to think about businesses um, and how we can actually learn from each other in a partnership between Australia and India. I think one thing has become evident that we're also seeing that evidence to support at the highest level. The two prime ministers have submitted um, a program on waste plastics recycling. So we're part of that program as well, which I think um, and this goes right back to some of the points we're going to do uh, today. And I, I would imagine in movies as well that uh, we hope that there's some you know, motivation to reduce plastic waste. And But I think, again, this is an, an indication. It's not just about Australia and India. It's about um, global awareness. It's, yeah. it's absolutely a global force now. And I think to me, the fact that the two PMs have initiated this uh, joint program, um, mm -hmm. I think it also goes to show that as two countries, we respect mm -hmm. our environment, we respect the fact that you know we want to bring everyone along the journey. We don't want anyone to be left behind. Yeah. So the people who, who work as rag pickers, people who use terminologies, there are words like Kabariwalas and rag pickers and so on. I think to create business opportunities where men and women can actually thrive by taking some of these materials and manufacturing high quality products that are required in our society is that whole new shift um, in, in our journey. So I guess, you know, we talk about all kinds of age and revolution in, in times, but I think materials revolution is upon us. We all know that there are limited resources on our planet. We can't keep uh, you know, making things and throwing it away into landfill. But I think to me, it goes to show whether we're talking about plastics or electronic waste, uh, we don't get into a lot of detail. I think the two countries and the partnership between the two countries uh, can be quite powerful. Uh, and I think in Australia, one might say one of the relevance is, again, in a business setting, lots and lots of SMEs uh, across the remote and regional towns uh, where you can see you know, people want to be part of this new materials revolution. But I see those opportunities for micro factories, which is uh, some of the inventions um, that we've done, also having a huge impact uh, from a business setting point of view, and particularly, I think, for, for women, where you traditionally may not think that manufacturing is the space to be yeah, in. Yeah. I think at operating these micro businesses uh, can actually make, make a big, big difference in the way you can be part of the supply yeah. chain globally. Uh, so I think it's a whole new mindset yeah. shift to where yeah. businesses can position themselves to create really high value products yeah. from waste. So it's very counterintuitive, but I think that's really what we see that waste plastics, electronics, yeah. uh, textiles, yeah. and other things are part of waste recycling. It's not even a bad thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's hopefully a positive and a brighter future coming out of uh, waste, waste recycling. Yeah. So thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you, Rina. And um, just because for the sake of time, we have several people even virtually who have linked in with us. And uh, Professor Nina Mitter, am I able to bring you in, particularly share some of your thoughts on the agri space? Uh, thanks, Shiva. Thanks always for your inspiration and motivation and really privileged to be here. In the interest of time, I'll also keep brief. So I work at the University of Queensland Coming from India, I think agriculture is in my DNA and uh, the power of agriculture to influence us, you know, socially, economically, environmentally, politically. Looking at the pandemic and some of the discussion that's going around of women in leadership, I, I think, you know, pandemic has changed the way we think about not only how we grow and produce, but how we distribute, how we consume food and fiber. And if we look at some of the stats, half of all we eat, half of the rural workforce, and half of all farm income is produced by women. So agriculture is one space where really women are playing a very key role, but what this role at present is more of a supportive role. What we need to do together with AIBC and PICI and all of you coming forward 
that we need to bring women more in the leadership role. If we look at the percentage of CEOs in the agribusiness sector, the number is not very heartwarming. And this is true both for Australia and India. So we have a lot of complementarity in the agribusiness sector between Australia and India. We have common crops, common challenges, common issues of food waste, food agility, sustainability, as Veena was mentioning. So I think together we can really do much more in this space and I'm hopeful that we'll continue to do more. Thank you. And I have uh, Helen there. Helen, are you there? Are you able to share quickly a minute or two from your end? Uh, yes, I am. Apologies for having been off video, but I'm actually sitting in my car, so apologies. <laughs> um, it's a privilege to have joined today's session. I've learned a lot already. Um, a couple of things I thought I'd share with the group. Um, at Deloitte, a couple of things that are really important. One is the support that we give to women in business. Really, really important um, priority for Deloitte. And, and secondly, how do we support um, inbound and export and, and, ex and, and inbound and outbound um, business in and out of India into Australia, so between the two countries. So I thought I'd just share a couple of insights on what we're seeing with our clients and, and what we're talking to our clients about. So from an inbound perspective, I think there's been quite a few um, investments from Indian companies in tech space and mining. Those have been the two areas where we've probably seen you know, a lot of inbound investment. But what we're seeing at the moment is a lot of businesses who are starting to explore investing in infrastructure in Australia, um, and particularly in the Western Parkland City. We're actually speaking to some of the largest business houses in India at the moment, but potentially investing. So that's really exciting. Um, and then from an outbound perspective, obviously, as one of the earlier speakers spoke about, the demographics and the growth opportunities in India are massive. Um, so there are actually a lot of opportunities for Australian companies to invest into India, as we've talked about. So far, traditionally, a lot of that has been in the resources sort of sector, a lot of um, you know, exports in oil and, and coal and, 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 and energy. Um, but one of the things that's quite interesting at the moment is most of the ASX top 100 Australian Australian companies actually have some presence in India at the moment in some form or another, whether it's a back office or actually, you know, starting to, to set up businesses over there. The pandemic has actually highlighted the issues around supply chains and global supply chains. And many of those companies are looking at de-risking their global supply chains and moving from just having a reliance on, on China to actually looking at having supply chains elsewhere. So obviously India is a is a big market for that. We've actually seen the UK and the US probably be first movers in that space. Tesla has made a huge investment recently into India, Apple, Amazon, et cetera, in the last sort of 12 months. Probably that's one area where Australia needs to do more. Um, and I think that's the next focus area for, for Australian businesses. See the other areas that we've touched on are, you know, Australia's expertise in infrastructure and supporting infrastructure in India itself. And then renewables, renewable energy, that's another huge area where we're seeing a lot of interest. Um, obviously, India's got some very um, aggressive targets around renewable energy, 30% of, of energy um, and 50% electric vehicles by 2030. So again, I think some of the technology and innovative skills within Australian businesses can help to achieve those. Um, and obviously Australia needs to become less relevant on our coal exports. And then the last sort of area where there's significant opportunities would be health, life sciences and pharmacy. I know there's a lot of investment in India in, in that sector. And I think again, massive opportunities for Australian businesses um, to, to assist and to grow in that space. So that was probably my comments. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to address the group. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank you very much. Insights really do help in terms of what's happening between the two countries. Um, I might just, uh, Mona, would you like to say a few words from your perspective? I'm sorry, we have to make it a little bit more brief okay. as we go along, okay. but I do because we have such amazing talent and experience and resources. I'd really love to hear from everyone. 
Thank you, Shiva, for having me here. And uh, thank you, Manish, as well as all the other eminent people on the table and the uh, in India as well as in Australia. As you know, I've been running the Hindi school, which I started in 1987. It's been 34 years. It's a long journey in which I have experienced uh, much between with the, at the grassroots level with the community and built up the awareness of the Hindi language in Australia, and particularly in New South Wales. And in New South Wales, we were the pioneers. We now have uh, two curriculums for Hindi, which is the National Curriculum and Akara, as well as the State Curriculum and English Language. And we have 10 public schools offering the language, and we're waiting for the first high school to take it on. It was supposed to start at Plumpton High School, Tim Roy, he was going to start there, but unfortunately, COVID happened and we had a lot of issues with the schools in New South Wales. Having said that, we have uh, many more now community language schools like ours who have uh, come up over the years and are also offering Hindi in different parts of the city of uh, the state. And I keep getting calls from more and more to start in different areas, such as New South Wales. In, uh, the Hunter area and different areas. But COVID has taught us a lot. It has taught us how we can deliver the uh, Hindi language classes online. And this has worked amazingly well with our teachers. We have a full, we have over 24 dedicated, committed teachers who are absolutely amazing at delivering the language. And we do that now. We continue to do online classes. Last year, we went totally online. But this year we're doing half face to face and half online. And we've got students who moved interstate as well as into suburb, and they're continuing learning Hindi with us. We've had educationists such as uh, Professor Robin Maloney, who has been studying Hindi with us from Macquarie University. And she actually has initiated a partnership with Chitkara University in Chandigarh and has also learned the language from one of our teachers. We have other uh, Hindi is taught at two universities, that taught with Peter Vitanda, as well as with the Ian Wolfberg at La La Tro, which we recently saved, nearly got the axe. So we need to promote, because as I say, it's not just a language, it teaches you a lot about the country, and it gives our students a sense of identity. And anyone who's dealing with India or seriously investing in India, it's important to understand the people, and that is where it helps in doing business with India as well. And for the last two years, I've been, uh, I initiated a women's, uh, women's shed in our local area. And that was basically because of the social issues faced by a lot of our young women, and also to mentor young students to come in forward. And I was very proud to say that Veena was our keynote speakers at our event yesterday. And this was not just, you know, from the Indian diaspora. It was women from the Australian community, wider Australian community. And they are understanding links between the two countries, how we how we have such outstanding people. And where my children are concerned as an educator, we are able to shape our future generations into taking leadership roles, as spoken so well today. And we have young women who just joined Ernest and Young, and we have uh, young women from our school who have joined who are leading outstandingly well in APRA, various companies, and they continue to take this lang the language with them. And, and we have a young journalist student who has taken herself to India on a fellowship. And she is actually a public every event over there. So we have such outstanding students, so I cannot be proud of them. And as you say, we do have a hand, fortunately, in shaping them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marla. Really appreciate the insight. Back to uh, share Expo Council of Australia time uh, for you to share because I think Expo Council of Australia is going to play a fairly key role uh, in terms of the export import trade, considering what's happening in this part of the country with some other countries that we were hugely dependent on. And I think. Uh, and I always, I know when I spoke at the Pravasi Bharat Universe, I said, I do not want to see India as a substitute for any other country. I want to see India as a destination of its own because 
the opportunities that it uh, represents outside of democracy, of course, is huge. So how do you see this relationship? I, I totally, uh, hello everyone, welcome um, and uh, to everyone. So that you may want to end up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, I agree, Shiva. Uh, the the opportunities in India are, are very, very immense and exciting. Uh, our, our natural relationship, as Jody mentioned, is currently thirty billion. Our relationship, our bilateral relationship with China, is currently two hundred billion. So there's a lot of room in scope. But taking your point, it shouldn't be a substitute, and that's not how we're looking at that. This this relationship has been nurtured for a number of years now. We have had the, um, the strategic relationship economic agreement with the nine MOUs. We also have, and I saw the scene on the, the um, screen yes, before, yes. we had the AIBX um, wonderful visit last year. And Austrade are working now on a platform for the AIBX to continue, to come out very quickly, to continue to do this in a, in a virtual way going forward until we can travel again. That will be fabulous because it will keep the relationship open and, and continuous. The, the opportunities are, are, are immense in the, in the areas of, of services, uh, you know, in clean energy, in climate change um, renewables, uh, in, as you said, uh, the waste management area. We can learn a lot from that as well in Australia. We have a great potential here and we shouldn't just let it sort of slide away because, um, because of COVID. We need to keep building on that. And the, it, these relationships that you're building with, um, with, with India and the other associations are very, very important. That keeps the relationship going. The relationships that Cricket and Australia is doing and that Super, Australian Super is doing is very, very important. We all need to work together collaboratively as, as, a, as a team, Australia and Team India, to make this work. And it can be very beneficial for everyone, not just as, as you were concerned about, that it shouldn't just be the place to think about because of other issues. It's, it, it's an opportunity to be really uh, part of a, 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 a group of, of um, like-minded people. I mean, we've, had, we've, we've got the quad now going. Um, we've got these sorts of ideas that are going to build our strength and, and opportunities. And I'll leave it there because I don't want to take away from um, Julie. Julia? Ju Julia. Yeah, we've so not met, but I know you might do. I do want to say one thing. We, we have been working with Department of Foreign Affairs on a number of programs just in the gender diversity yes. area, women trading globally, have some wonderful women all around the Southeast Asia area, including um, India, uh, Asia, um, Indian ladies, and we're still working with them online. And it's remarkable to see these ladies that have come from very, very small village type businesses mm -hmm. that are now able to sell internationally. A lot of it e-commerce at the moment because that's what they're, they're able to do at their level at this stage, but we're working with them still online to build their capacity and capabilities in trading internationally. And we hope to continue those programs once the flights start again, we bring them to Australia and train them. So we're very proud to be part of that program, very proud to be a very highly diverse business ourselves. In fact, I'm worried we're too gender diversity at, at the UCA, we, we probably need to have that. I think a leader is a leader, no matter what the, the opportunity is, so thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. You know, seriously, uh, I have been um, often. You all called me Mukundi um, Bidbad as a judge for the investment pitching process. And my favorite, my favorite person was a sixty-plus woman entrepreneur from Gujarat. Yeah. Husband was a forex trader. He lost everything. He went into mental depression. She was a housewife all the six years. She didn't know what to do, but she knew one thing that she did very well because everybody loved it. And that was the pickles yes. and the jams and other yes. things she made. She picked up her uh, act. She said, I'll get started in the kitchen. And she turned it around. Yes. Don picked her up. Deep. And I was so proud that moment when I saw, I mean, she, when she came and sat in front of us, four of us, and she said, my pitch is my story. That's all she said. It took three minutes and she walked out of it. Yeah. So the uh, ECA and DPAT are doing some amazing stuff together. Um, and thank you for continuing to do that because it was amazing. And I might just uh, hop back to Meena, Dr. Meena Singh here. She's with us from Macquarie University. And I know Meena over the years, she is the first one who has been pushing. She has international business. She has been taking her students to India to actually go and see what the business environment is and actually 
um, you know, get to experience it, not just sitting in the classrooms, but actually um, in the industry and in companies there. Would you like to share? I know, Mina, we're running out of time, but a quick minute or two. Uh, you're on mute, Mina. You're on mute. Sorry. Yep, we can hear you. Hello, Sheba. Hello, all the dignitaries. Thank you for inviting me to this session. Very inspiring. Sheba has always been inspiring, not just to me, but to all the Indian women here in Sydney. And uh, she's a real asset, a legend in the Indian community. Um, we have today heard from uh, uh, our esteemed guests on production, manufacturing, sustainability, agriculture. And here I am to talk about education. But I would just like to state in just one single sentence that education is the number one export earner for Australia and specifically from India. And we at Macquarie University have very strong ties with India. We do an Indian study tour every year. We have many of our students who take up internships with a number of companies, including Tata Steel, and uh, we have many of our uh, student exchange programs with XLRI, XLRI in Jamshedpur, as well as uh, uh, IIT Mumbai, and as well as I am in Ahmedabad. So we have very strong ties, whereby we have a number of PhD students to come to Macquarie University to conduct their research. And we are very happy to extend this uh, uh, linkage, this connection, while uh, COVID, actually COVID has been um, excellent. We have been thinking that with uh, the borders closed, our students will not be joining our programs, but uh, uh, at Macquarie University, the story is pretty positive and we still have a number of students. Um, in fact, 60% uh, of the students in my class are from India. Um, that's about it. Thank you very much. And uh, it was a pleasure coming and listening to all of the esteemed guests. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Meena. I'd also share that when I, she had actually invited me to speak to her students, and then I wanted to meet the alumni, and I found out that all the guys who had gone to India, guess what? 30% 30, 30 of them had set up, they had become entrepreneurs in something to do with India. Now, see the overreaching influence that education has. That is why it's so important to get those insights. Julia, I would like you to share a few things if I, if I may. And you may have to look that side so yes, that thank you can capture it. Thank you so much. And I just thank the Consul General and also the uh, Australia, India, Australia India Business uh, Council, Women in Business Chapter, Sheila, uh, to you for convening this uh, opportunity to speak. And I want to acknowledge the uh, Excellency, the Commission of India to Australia for his opening remarks and uh, my colleague Rowan Ainsworth, the Consul General of Australia in Kolkata. It's great to see you there, Rowan, and all the wonderful women who've made contributions today. I feel that so many great things have been said. There's almost um, uh, not much more that can be said in terms of uh, tangible examples of what we need to do and what we can do in growing this wonderful relationship. Um, everyone's aware that the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership was signed by our two Prime Ministers in June 2020. But we also have, as uh, Diana acknowledged, the uh, Australia India Economic Strategy and the Australian Economic Strategy is two pivotal strategies that will drive the economic relationship, um, trade and investment relationship forward going into the future. So these are not just visionary documents, they're, they're important frameworks for taking forward um, our economic relationship and to really harness some of the opportunities that we, we uh, see that we have between our two countries. Um, they also require that we understand, as someone has touched on before, the context and some of the barriers, some of the challenges, and also the opportunities in the trade and economic relationship. Um, we have a very high level of ambition in our trade and economic relationship with India. I think that's, that's shared uh, on the India side as well. But uh, we really want to um, have as a very important part of that um, a, a really strong linkage or hook into all the things we've been talking today about women's economic empowerment and the vital role that women play 
in the economic relationship from the grassroots, small business owners, women entrepreneurs that we've, we've mentioned, um, but also some of the challenges that are faced by women in the COVID economic recovery phase that the world is going through. Um, that means, uh, as I think uh, my colleague Rowan touched on, the disproportionate effect of COVID on women in so many ways, not just in employment, but in other ways, um, has been that we've got to keep an eye open for how when we move forward in the post-COVID um, uh, period, we don't leave women behind. I think on International Women's Day, it's very important for me to acknowledge um, that gender equality and women's economic empowerment is a very uh, key priority for the Australian government. Uh, you may have seen um, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Minister for Women, um, our Minister Maurice Payne speak at the UN Women event uh, last uh, Friday. Um, and it's really clear that all the evidence shows that if women participate in all aspects of our economic and our political and our cultural life, our societies are far more vibrant and inclusive and productive. And I was really pleased to see, I think it was Deborah, touch on the value of um, learning about the impact of diversity and inclusive leadership and how that actually improves uh, your role as a leader and improves business outcomes. Um, I think we all have a responsibility and opportunity now to look at um, understanding all the barriers to women in getting into business. Um, we need to look at how we can adopt a more inclusive approach to this. And also, I think it's great to share stories of what success looks like. So hearing more and more stories of Anita Finch and Sheba, but also other stories of women's success in business um, uh, is really valuable. And clearly, we have a lot to learn from each other about this. It's not success is not accruing all to one particular side. So I guess for me, I just want to really acknowledge um, that from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade point of view, we put a lot of strong focus on gender equality, not just in our women in leadership strategy that we have, but also in some of our programs through our development assistance program, but also our scholarships program. Nina touched on the important role of education. We have an Australian awards program where we really try and make sure we have gender equality and who's in the scholarships. And we also have the business partnerships platform, which may have been the yeah. program you're referring to. Yeah. Where we really look at funding um, uh, business this station that would also yeah. give uh, uh, a kickstart yeah. to some uh, women in business. So, um, on International Women's Day, I want to acknowledge and um, celebrate the great successes that, that many of you around the table have shown in your working lives um, in business, but in other areas of leadership, of communities, and also in your roles. And, and I really am a firm believer that um, with full participation in all aspects of life, we're going to have um, a much better chance of facing all the challenges we had in the post-COVID recovery period. So this is the first time that I've met you around the table. I've been in my role as the director of the New South Wales State Office of the Department for Affairs and Trade for two weeks. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm just, <laughs> just newly arrived. I'm very happy to be here. And thank you so much for including me. Uh, and a warm welcome today. to you. I'm thank sure you so we'll be all working closely together. I look forward to that. And thank you for making time. That thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you. And um, I'd like to, um, uh, for the sake of time, perhaps Harriet, if you wanted to share quickly, Harriet is from TCS. And uh, she's you've taken over recently, right? Uh, you've just joined. Speaking of newly arrived, I'm also <laughs> the vast experience of two weeks. Two weeks, and that's what I was thinking. You can call us the whole group. So, Harriet, Harriet, over to you. Harriet heads corporate affairs for TCS Australia New Zealand. That's my favorite. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shiva, for having me. I'm very delighted to be included in this group. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am attending this meeting. To keep it very brief because there are many people to speak, perhaps the most important thing I need to say is uh, not surprisingly being in a technology company, what is clearly an exciting opportunity in supporting the trade and investment relationship is the power of technology to remove divides. We are seeing how technology can remove divides within our countries, between city and region, from privileged and underprivileged, we are seeing how technology can remove the geographical divide between our countries. And that is going to be a driver of hastening trade and investment outcomes by speeding up processes. 
of course, in order to balance it out, like my own company, uh, Charter has literally been contributing to building connections. They the have a fiber subsidy cable network, which is partly responsible for the virtual streaming, this kind of thing that we use today. Uh, we also have a very active program. Next week, we are about to start um, taking 150 school girls across the country. Uh, and for the rest of the year, we'll be putting them through an intensive program, encouraging them to take up a career in uh, science and STEM. We have ambitions to grow that program. But as I and as the company looks at our agenda going forward, coming out of COVID and the Australia-India relationship, and as the company looks at its presence in both countries, the possibilities are for digitization, digitalization and technology to, to create rapid movement as companies and governments undertake their own digital transformation process. Makes it a very exciting time to be here. And uh, thank you therefore for the opportunity to be with us. That's really good. Thank you and welcome to you too. <laughs> I'm sure thank we'll you. be working a lot more together now. Uh, that you are there, and um, not just uh, we've got week, we've got Preeti, and we've got Tamanna. Uh, we don't have too much of time because Vic is also there. But did you all have anything you wanted to quickly share, guys? Reek, you are on mute. Vic, you are on mute. Preeti, did you want to share something? Preeti? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Shiva. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be part of this amazing event on uh, such a special day and, and many congratulations on this wonderful initiative. It's just enriching to hear everybody that's present today. Uh, just wanted to mention that in your intro, you said that women in senior management for India stood at 39% as against the global average. In fact, a report was launched last week by Grant Thornton where it said that India ranks third in the world for women working in senior management positions after Philippines and South Africa. So there you go, that those stats are validated as of last week. Um, there are many other areas, I suppose, um, that India and Australia could work uh, very am amicably towards, uh, but I guess, given my hat of the national sports chair, it'll be remiss of me to not mention the T20 Women's Cricket Tournament last year. Uh, which many of you have mentioned previously, and, and uh, along with you, Sheba and Sonia, I was quite a, I was a very proud ambassador of. Uh, reflecting back, it, it was a historic uh, uh, IWD last year to witness Australia and India women's cricket team playing at the G, watched by close to 90,000 people uh, and the audiences worldwide. And I think special acknowledgement to Nick Hockley, who was sitting there in the boardroom, for his amazing leadership in making this happen. And really kudos to Australia for leading the world in lifting women and sports to the world stage. But it needs sustained momentum to really make women and sports more mainstream, uh, whether that's increasing media coverage of women's sporting events, securing bigger sponsorships for women's teams uh, and tournaments, more equal pay for women in sport, better support and greater respect overall. And I truly believe this is an area India and Australia can work together as partners uh, to live women in sports, uh, given the huge potential this presents socially by strengthening people to people ties, which we all know leads to better trade and investment relationship. Uh, and of course, commercially for both the countries. So I, I will just conclude by saying that um, today is a day to really acknowledge women's rights, gender equality, parity, and, and call to action for accelerating women's equality. And I'll leave you with this message a gender equal society would be one where the word gender does not exist, where everyone can be equal. So thank you. Thank you, Preeti. Shiva, sorry. Um, oh, mm -hmm. hi. Um, I'd just like to um, say only a few words. Um, congratulations. And I'm very, very highly privileged to witness this wonderful occasion. Mm -hmm. Um, between the MOU signing between AIBC and FIKI Flow. Um, in my role from the um, Ipsu City Council, local government, I actually facilitate industry development, which is empowering multiple industries, including defense, manufacturing, education and training, food and agribusiness, has been with AIBC since 2002, a longest serving member. 
and also facilitated a lot of Australian India um, export relationships in, in six sector. So what I would like to do is I just wanna um, say that you are all welcome to visit the region and anytime I'm happy to facilitate B2B introductions with many business, uh, with female leaders between Australia, India, and also from Queensland. And when you come here, uh, we'll be happy to facilitate roundtable with our senior leaders in the region. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Tamara. Would you like to share anything, please? We, we. Okay, no worries. I think Reed, are you there? Okay, the audio is not working. Wick, would you like to come in and share anything before we uh, hand over? And Margaret, would you like to share something? Sure. Um, hi, um, my name is Margaret Fo. I'm the founder CEO of Science Medical Services. We're a med tech company. Um, I've been doing business in India for 10 years, but traveling to India for 30. Um, it's my second home. Uh, prior to COVID, I was on that flight up to India roughly every six weeks. Definitely struggling because I have been unable to find a decent Marsala dosa anywhere for the last four months. Um, but look, what I would say is um, echoing some of the comments that Julia made, um, both uh, the strategy documents um, talk about health. So health is my area, health systems. Um, health financing systems and health system education. That's the area that my company works in. There are enormous opportunities for reciprocal trade in the area um, of health, um, particularly digital health and also um, telehealth and you know, making health accessible to remote areas. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities there. There's three things I would say about doing business in India. Um, firstly, um, I'm, I'm also a lawyer, so uh, when I was setting up a business in India, all the legal documents looked very much the same to me because we both countries inherited a Westminster system of parliamentary democracy. So um, it, it's not as hard as I think a lot of Australians perceive it to be. Um, we have the same really corporate structures. Um, it's all fairly straightforward. And I can say that with experience because I also have an office in Dubai. We have 100 staff. So we have 80 in India and we have, you know, about 10 or 12 here and one in Dubai. And um, so I've established a company in Dubai as well. And I can honestly say that setting up a company and a business in India was much easier than Dubai because um, Dubai is a very foreign system of, um, you know, uh, corporate governance and, and, and structures. Um, so I felt very much in the hands of my Dubai lawyer, who was a brilliant woman, and I felt that she was right across it. But I really had to trust her. I didn't really understand those structures as much. It's not as hard as people think. I would echo Deborah's words, just do it, put dip a toe in. I would also say that, Setting up a business in India most definitely put Synapse on the global map. Um, once it was known that we had an office in India and we were loud and proud about that out on the socials, social media and the airwaves, we were contacted by people from all over the world wanting to do business with us or at least talk to us because they could see that we were serious about a global mindset and had an interest in partnership with international trade. So we now are doing business in eight countries. So that's very, very exciting. And we would not have had that opportunity had we not established an office in India. No question about that. Um, and, and look, the only other thing I'd echo Deborah's words, relationships, relationships, relationships. Gallons of chai need to be consumed prior to any serious business transpiring. So patience. <laughs> <laughs> remember that Margaret's experience which she had shared with me a few years ago was hey come Monday morning and I'm in my office in Australia and then I start receiving these calls well I'm not feeling too well today I might not be able to pop in which is a damn well I know they have a uh, you know they must have had a late night and therefore they're not coming in cut to my office in Chennai or Bangalore wherever Chennai. it was <laughs> Chennai right, Chennai, right. and um, Monday morning uh, office is meant to open at 9, 8.30 people are passionately standing to get in. 
that's Indian stuff for you. So mm. amazing, you know, what can actually happen. This is exactly what we're talking about, you know, really re-looking really at perceptions that people have of India, what actually happens there. Mm. So thank you, Margaret, for joining us today. And uh, I'd like to come to you, Nimisha, before I hand over to Sonia, thinking that if you could share something. Now, Nimisha is a linguist as well as a educator. And uh, spoken opportunities uh, with Muslim India in Australia in the field of education and having worked with the designing of curriculum and assessment, I feel that uh, India's e-learning sector is going rapidly. And the digital, uh, digital education, it has revolutionized the field of teaching practices. And especially uh, due to lack of resources and innovative materials in some of the remote areas, digital education is going to be very, very uh, essential and very meaningful in connecting uh, to distance learning. Um, also, I feel that uh, India is waking up to the realization that Industry 4.0 needs Education 4.0. Uh, education 4.0, it has been talked about for some time, but during COVID-19, I think it, uh, it became a catalyst in progressing uh, this evolution. So uh, education 4.0 is about rethinking education at all stages of the schooling. It embraces technology and has learning experiences to equip with social emotional skills that tomorrow's fast changing work landscapes are going to require. Uh, so hybrid higher learning is the meat of the hour. And uh, we also need to redesign the classrooms now. Uh, the new university campus will uh, have to be hybrid of original campus and some repurposed services. So more breakout areas and which can allow students to collaborate in smaller groups. Now with the uh, model of Asian students studying abroad, Australian universities could think of establishing new campuses in more geographically convenient locations of the continent. Uh, we already know that George Institute for Global Health, uh, Australia has a medical research institute in India, and it is raising funds to support uh, research uh, post fellowships, programs, and infrastructure. So I think this is a, a big promising sector for other Australian companies to tap this potential. Now research and innovation, the field of agriculture as well, uh, it has a lot of potential where the expertise from Australian counterparts can be leveraged to produce better yield and also adopt the latest technology and practices. Uh, Australian vocational education, the TAFE courses, they, pro uh, they can also be provided from Australia's leading education providers and they can be delivered online to Indians as a, as a tertiary education option for those who are looking to gain vocational qualification for numerous fields and industries including uh, financial, health care, hospitality, tourism, building and construction. I think this is a major area where India needs a lot of attention in this respect. Then uh, the National Education Policy 2020 in India it outlines the vision of India's new education system. And uh, this uh, new education system will include um, opening of uh, higher education, uh, uh, the international universities, they can open up their setups in India. And it focuses on overhauling the curriculum with easier exams, reduced syllabus to retain core essentials, and also experiential learning and critical thinking. And I think that with this significant sh uh, shift, India has a bright future in education sector. Uh, also, we know that you already know that Baidu's, which uh, sponsored the India Australia series. Uh, it is an online tutoring firm and which, uh, which was founded 10 years ago uh, by a young entrepreneur. So there is a lot of scope for startups and it has a comprehensive e-learning program for K-12 and other competitive exams. To name a few, OYA, um, uh, OYO, OLA, Flipkart, Paytm. These are some of the examples of startups by our young entrepreneurs. And I think this is where we need to tap the potential of youth. Now, I see that there's a big opportunity to help build synergies in education sector specifically to give a boost to such young creative minds. Uh, Brand India is not inward looking. 
and we are ready to collaborate, expand, and advance globally. I'm so glad you touched on Brown India 100% because that's the new India. And on that front, I might get Kavita to come in now as the CEO of Bank of Baroda to talk a little bit more about Brand India and what Brand India banks can do for Australians. Can you do a couple? And then I'm sure she will, uh, you know, give you a video or something. Yeah. Thank you, Shabba. 
Good afternoon, uh, Sheba. Could I interrupt for one moment, please? Yeah. We have Red Pawani on the phone from Victoria, um, who would like to take one minute of your time just to yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
trend or relationship will continue on where both the government partners are consistently able to join the conversation, post it and keep the momentum going. I absolutely loved what the uh, Fiki National President, Jami, said about embracing change. I think it's exceptionally important to embrace change. You've got 8,000 members. I can't even begin to imagine how difficult that would be uh, from that, from a COVID perspective. But I think all of us are exceptionally agile now, have to be really resilient in how we do business. But there's definitely a silver lining to the COVID cloud. You know, it's taught us a lot more in digitization and technology and how accessible, you know, uh, speakers are as well. So we're able to access them wherever they are across the globe. Um, lastly, in closing, I want to wish everyone a very happy International Women's Day. And uh, keeping in with the theme, I choose to challenge, I think there's a lot of learning to be done between who we are. We all individually challenge our own sectors incredibly powerfully, but I think the onus is on us to build and take this relationship forward, especially representing Brand India. I think if each one of us takes that ownership, each one of us who's sitting in this room, who's online, who's participated and engaged across this platform is our true <laughs> two nation brand ambassador for this relationship. Thank you. Thank you so much. Alicia, and just uh, to your comment, that has been fantastic. Uh, since today we are celebrating the Absolute Achievement, I have written uh, a short poem and, uh, in which I have uh, taken a few lessons to the symbol that reminds us that we can and stay rooted as we go through our lives. So the title of my poem is The Living Tree. Strength and glory, you stood proud and tall. Beauty, dignity, grace, and courage above all. Is there anything in nature more beautiful than a woman? Planting the roots deep enough in the tough ground to bring forth strong branches, green leaves, and flowers plant. Like a majestic tree looking at the heaven or rain, she offers shelter and rest to the heart in pain. Loving and loved, nurturing and nurtured, all alone, blessing the lives of others as well as of me. Here you are, should I say, you the tree or the living tree. The time for the journey will soon come to a distant end, a new life to begin with no regrets or ways to end. Fulfilling your promises with joy and pleasure at work of your eating of priceless pleasure. I think it's the resilience of women that and the inner strength that actually takes your heart. I just didn't. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. So, okay, so they might have a have some lunch. So maybe when they invite people, they cannot go. I've said I've locked the door. <laughs> so please help yourself to some lunch. And uh, thank you, everyone. That closes officially our formal session for today. Thank you for those who have been virtual with us. Uh, we really appreciate your presence. And thank you for all the different leaders. And I know, Rose, you have programmed. You have some programs. Julia, I know. Vina, you have pull yourself out, every one of us. We, uh, we have very busy schedules and really appreciate uh, your presence here and physically, because I know Rosie has to You know, after this COVID period, it's been so, and especially because Rose used to be in Melbourne and now she's in Sydney. So we were especially delighted as just come along in person. So thank you everyone. Uh, for being here, but as I said, the doors are closed now. Please <laughs> uh, help yourself for something before we all meet. And my apologies, it's all over time, but I think all of us really enjoyed the session and uh, the insights that everybody uh, shared was just amazing. Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you. Requesting for a group shot for yes. everyone. Yeah. Okay, we'll do that. Yeah, I can close it. They could be in the